Now, let's begin. Uh, I believe all of you know what you're here for. Today we're organizing, I believe it's the fifth or sixth crash course that we have so far. Uh, it's a crash course on globalization. We've gotten a lot of requests for crash courses, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, it takes a lot of time to prepare for one, as Joven can testify. So, uh, you know, we, we can't run this on a regular basis. But the reason why I run this is that, you know, I want to uh, help my students out with the content. I don't have a lot of time for content and you know it often takes a lot of time for, for us to update the content, to um, handpick the content, to get rid of the old outdated content, to bring in new facts and figures that uh, will be helpful for your examination. So uh, I believe, I'm very confident that you're going to learn a lot in this crash course and you're going to use a lot of these facts uh, in your exams. Okay, I'm sure you're going to use some of these facts in your exam. But first of all, okay, anyway, uh, if you are uh, here, I just want to have a quick sensing of who's here. Uh, can you tell us where you are, who you are, where do you study? Are you in J1, J2, or J3? If you're not in Singapore, I know a lot of you are not in Singapore. You're in like Mauritius. <laughs> okay, if you're not in Singapore, just tell us what country you come from. Yeah, uh, just post it in the chat. Also good for me to see how the chat um, works so far. Okay, perfect. RQLK. Hello, thank you. Oh, this is, that's a good mixture. J1, J2, you can tell us the school you're from as well. Ah, Mauritius. Hello, Slovakia, fantastic. I'm quite sure you're from Slovakia. Okay, thank you. I, I got a mixed response from you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, like, like I said, this is about globalization. It's funny how we are experiencing this right now. I'm speaking to audience from like different continents. Uh, I believe Mauritius is part of Africa. Uh, I remember doing crash courses in the past and uh, people from Mauritius were texting me afterwards saying that, hey, you know, thank you so much for the crash course. I'm from Mauritius. You know, if you ever come to Africa, please visit Mauritius. And you know, me being me, you know, I went on to Google to find where Mauritius is uh and yeah i realized it's a very beautiful island like somewhere near madagascar yeah i would really love to visit that. i'm sure in my lifetime at some point in life i'll be visiting mauritius and uh, those of you who promise to bring me around mauritius okay yeah <clears throat> please do so <laughs> i would love a good tour guide there all right uh instructions to take note uh and things to take note of uh the notes the slides won't be available uh to you right now if you want them uh, just text me privately later on okay uh you don't have to ask me in the chat later on uh, is it going to be available for now just focus on the crash course uh just learn as much as possible and if you have any questions just put it down in the chat below um i will Try to come back to it later on when we have a QA and a when we, or we, when we have a break. The crash course is supposed to last for one hour. It's very ambitious for me to do this in one hour uh, because we have quite a bit of uh, content to cover. But yeah, we'll try. Um, I expect it to be done at like 5.15. Yeah. Okay, back to globalization. All of you are here for the crash course on globalization. Now, um, now, when you think of the word globalization, when you see questions of globalization, right, uh, it's very important for you to look at it from different perspectives. Okay, uh, I will show you the different kinds of globalization questions you will get. Now, firstly, you know you have these four spheres. Okay, you have the economic uh, impact of globalization, social, social, cultural impact of globalization, political, health, and environment. So, four main topics, if I may, the subtopics. So for Economics, we have like global trade, economic integration, MNCs, flow of information. Uh, all these are economic in nature, uh, easier to put them that way. And for political, which kind of overlaps with economic, we have like international cooperation, foreign aid, migration, displacement of people, meaning refugees. Uh, and then you know, th these are the hard side of globalization. We also have the soft side of globalization, the impact on the intangible, like national identity, language, culture, religion right here. Uh, and of course, uh, if you're interested on like the other impacts of globalization, you might think of the environment. You 
might have gone through the crash course on, crash course on the environment. I'm not going to go through much on this, yeah? but let's just have a look at some of the questions that you might see in A-levels for economic and political. We have you know, discussed the extent to which global and national interests can be balanced. That's a bit political. Uh, national boundaries make a little geographical or economic sense nowadays, economic in nature. Uh, I, uh, okay, immigration, is it good or bad? Uh, war will be a thing of the past. And I think one of the common ones that we saw, I believe it was two years ago in A-level, was you know, should globalization be welcomed or feared? So that's a very broad topic. Most students who did that, if they have you know, seen, they've gone through my lecture on globalization, they, they would have done very well, I believe. And social cultural side of things, we have questions like patriotism, multiculturalism, monolingualism, bilingualism. Uh, to what extent is the homogenous world culture desirable? And then we have the health and environment side of things. Globalization has definitely, most people would agree, uh, a, a bad impact on the environment. So we're talking about things like transportation of goods and services over long distances, okay, mainly goods uh, like food, uh, and okay, you have like in light of health issues, is globalization more of a curse than a blessing? Twenty twenty and twenty twenty one is a very you know funny period for us to be, uh, because we see globalization. Okay, over the past couple of years, we see like you know, increasing interconnectedness over the years, and people were really benefiting from this. And then COVID hit, and suddenly everyone started to wake up and say, hey, you know, are we on the right track at all? And at the same time, we have other forces like, you know, nationalism, which is quite the opposite of globalization. Okay, uh, the word nationalism comes from the word nation. Globalization comes from the word global. So it's like, you know, nation, a state versus like the globe. Um, so they lie in like different scales. So the more you want to be nationalistic, the less global you are. So we're seeing all these changes. So I believe this is a topic that uh, Cambridge is also very interested in. So something for you to think about. Today we're going to cover three main top three main domains: a political, economic, and social cultural domains. Uh, we're not going to touch on environment because I've covered environment. If you want to read up more about environment, just go on to our crash course on environment. It's available on YouTube. Uh, I think you're going to like that crash course as well. Okay, if you are learning nothing today from my crash course, you just got to remember this: there are six key drivers of globalization. And you have to remember these six. I'm going to give you five seconds to remember all these six things. Okay, so there's flow of information, trade, migration, flow of capital, meaning money, trade blocks, I'll explain a little bit, and MNCs, multinational corporations. These six things underpin globalization. I do not consider anything else, okay? Uh, air travel, I try not to talk about it in, uh, in the context of GP because it tends to be a little, um, a little irrelevant in most uh, discussions. And the topic of, uh, what is that, tourism? No, 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 tourism is not globalization, okay? Migration is globalization because you are going to a country, you're staying there for an extended period of time. Tourism is not, uh, it's always been around. So as uh, we are going through this, crash course, keep in mind, we will be organizing them in, you know, uh, in this manner, you know, these six things. So just put them in the appropriate boxes later on. Now, uh, let's look, look at the impact, the impacts of globalization, economically speaking. Okay, let's look at trade blocks first. What are trade blocks? Trade blocks are basically a group of, a group of countries coming together and say we should trade freely, reduce our tariffs, and, um, and maybe even uh, adopt a single currency system. So trade blocks are uh, very common today and increasingly common because of uh, signing of some new FTA, free trade agreements. Uh, at the same time, some regions, especially uh, the EU, they've adopted uh, a more advanced level of trade block where they also integrate themselves economically, politically, and socially. So <coughs> uh, trade blocks in 2010, okay, we look at the positive benefit, uh, positive impact of trade blocks in 2010, uh, up to I think about 2015, Europe was going through the European debt crisis and uh, some nations like uh, Greece especially was really suffering from uh, increased governmental debt. They couldn't pay off the debt. So uh, Greece was seeking help from other countries within the EU, like uh, Germany and France, basically the entire EU, uh, in solving their debt crisis. In a way, trade block is very important to maintain regional stability. And EU is the most important trade bloc in the world. 
if you are studying globalization, pay attention to EU. You don't read a lot of news on EU, I believe, uh, in school. You, know, you tend to focus more on uh, the US, the UK, Asia, China, but EU, um, typically I don't see that a lot. Okay, and uh, another new development, it was last year, this year-ish, uh, come next January, there's going to be a new trade partnership called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. It is the biggest trade block in the world. It's going to cover one third of the world's GDP and population. Now, what countries will it cover? Now, these countries, um, Australia, Brunei, Japan, Malaysia, okay, you can see from this list, uh, sorry, Mauritius is not part of it, but all of these countries are within the Asia Pacific region. You have the ASEAN countries, the Southeast Asian countries like Singapore, uh, plus Australia, New Zealand, plus China, uh, Japan, South Korea, North Korea, not part of it. Now, this entire region I'm going to show you in this map basically is this region. You, if you can see my cursor over here, this entire region in the Pacific. Uh, the, these countries have come together and say we're going to form a partnership where we will trade with each other freely. It's going to generate a lot of additional income globally for this region. So it's a very, very important development in, the, uh, in recent years. We are not going to realize the benefits of this yet because uh, it will take years for us to finally see you know, how, this, uh, how these trades, these free trades work out. Okay. So that's RCEP. Remember that, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Okay. And other impacts of trade blocks, the EU, um, now this is kind of a bad thing now. We have uh, the good thing about uh, trade blocks where you can trade freely, but when you go on to a politically connected trade block like the EU, somehow countries have to give up their sovereignty, meaning as a nation, you can't decide on your own. You have to follow like the big brother, which is like the EU, the European Council. During the 2015 refugee crisis from Syria, uh, the whole of EU was suffering from like an influx of refugees and they didn't really know how to deal with it. So the EU uh, was in a way a bit heavy handed in saying, you, all you European countries, you got to take up like a certain proportion of these refugees. So the refugees were practically shoved to them. They have to take them in. Uh, it wasn't really a choice that they could make as a country. So that is kind of infringing on the sovereignty of nations. That's natural when you have a politically integrated trade bloc like the EU. So okay, that's a summary that you can look at after the crash course. Uh, moving on, uh, this is not exactly globalization. This is more of politics. We're talking about global institutions or multilateral organizations. What are these organizations? They are African Union, ASEAN, the United Nations, which is the biggest uh, international organization. These, are, these organizations can be beneficial in some ways. Uh, if you look at the African Union, without them, they wouldn't have solved or, or, or managed the COVID crisis as, uh, as effectively. The African Union has secured 1 billion doses of vaccine in Africa. It's not a lot, I would say, uh, for Africa, but it is better than, you know, than nothing. And ASEAN, of course, where we are in Singapore, uh, Singapore has benefited a lot from uh, ASEAN. Okay, uh, the free trade uh, agreements that we have and you know, the free travel between countries. If you are in one of these Southeast Asian countries, you want to travel to another Southeast Asian country, it's very likely that you don't have to apply for a visa to travel between countries. So when, in terms of like flow of people, the restrictions are not as uh, tight. However, uh, these kind of organizations can be somewhat ineffective as well. ASEAN is not like the EU because it doesn't have an overarching political system overseeing uh, other countries. You know, there's no ASEAN organization telling Singapore, telling Malaysia what to do. No such thing. So uh, the lack of enforcement becomes kind of like a problem as well. If you remember the crisis in Myanmar where uh, there's, there's a conflict going on right now, and the military, military junta is taking over the country. Now, most ASEAN nations were just doing nothing. We were practically you know, saying, oh, you, know, you shouldn't be doing this, but nothing was done. And that's understandable because nothing can be done. There's no overarching uh, political system that governs Myanmar. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip uh, this this part right here, um, you can kind of read this, but important for you to note uh, these two organizations, Inter International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, these two 
funds or banks, okay, they are international banks. They are not like your DBS bank or, or Deutsche Bank. They are huge banks. They can loan up money to governments because governments tend to need a lot of, we're talking about like billions and trillions and only uh, IMF and World Bank have the kind of money to loan out to governments. So they have a very important role in helping in the development of poorer nations, uh, developing countries, also in uh, stabilizing financial systems. So um, maybe we'll talk about Greece later. Greece was undergoing a financial crisis, just as I mentioned to you. And it was the IMF who came in to help Greece out, to get them out of the, uh, the, the debt crisis. Okay. okay, here's a summary that you can look at. Okay. Now, let's talk about global trade. Trade is the flow of goods and services between countries. You can sell to other countries freely nowadays, quite freely because of the signing of free trade agreements. This is the most important part of globalization. Forget everything but trade, international trade, is the biggest change that we have experienced uh, in globalization. Because it was through global, uh, this uh, lowering of tariffs that countries started to work more closely with each, other, with each other. In the past, most countries just produce enough goods for themselves. If they were to export things to other countries, they had to pay the tariffs, which is a tax on imports from another country. Singapore has benefited a lot from trade, definitely, because we are an international economy. We don't have any um, agricultural industry that you know, allows us to export to other countries, yet Singapore has exported a lot of food products to other countries. In 2019 alone, Singapore exported 12.8 billion worth of food products, it's like 13 billion, we're, we're talking billions, which is huge. So that has contributed a lot to our GDP, even though we are not an agricultural country. So trade is important, but the downside is countries also become very vulnerable to other uh, things that are happen happening in other parts of the world. Russia and Saudi Arabia in 2020, they were having a oil price war. They were lowering their, they were having a oversupply of oil. So that drove down oil prices a lot. At one point in time, oil prices went to negative. Okay, we're talking about the future, uh, which is a kind of contract, but basically it went negative. Can you imagine that? It costs zero dollar for you to buy oil. In fact, they will pay you to keep the oil. There was so much oil because of the oversupply. And that impact was felt in all parts of the world. And that also happened during uh, the COVID crisis as the pandemic was spreading throughout the world. After the, this oil price crash, the global stock market also crashed as a result of that. So what's happening in Saudi Arabia actually you know, can be felt in all parts of the world, in the US, and then it re reverberated throughout the planet. Uh, this is something interesting. I find this quite comical, actually. This is, a, this is a shipping incident that happened this year. There's a ship that was passing through the Swiss Canal, and it got somehow it got wedged in between. It looked like this. Okay. So it blocked the entire channel. The Swiss Canal is a very important channel between Asia and Europe. So in order to travel from Asia to Europe, you can either take the long route past Madagascar, South Africa, West Africa, and to, to uh, Europe. Western Europe, or you can take the Swiss Canal, just cut through here, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, boom, and now you're in Europe. The difference in number of days is, uh, as you can see, with Swiss Canal, 25 days, without, that's 34 days, that's like 9 to 10 days, close to 2 weeks, okay, 1 to 2 weeks time. And this ship, this joker, <laughs> decided to wedge itself uh, here in the Swiss Canal, and that created a blockage throughout this region. There were like 500 ships at one point waiting to cross the Suez Canal, waiting for this ship to be cleared. And they didn't know how long it would take. Eventually, it took about one week for this ship to be cleared. You know, one week might feel like nothing to you, but in the shipping industry, one week is a long, long time. The impact was felt even months after the ship was cleared for movement and Swiss Canal was cleared. Uh, it caused a surge in shipping costs. Uh, delay in shipping so some people couldn't get their goods in time. If you order something from Amazon, you, know, it, you, know, you have to wait like, uh, like maybe additional two, three weeks. Not one week, we're talking about like weeks or even months for your goods to arrive. Uh, there, was, there was even um, a study that says that shipping costs between China and Europe increased by four times because of this incident. Okay, four times, that's a lot. All right, so, uh, so a little bit about Swiss Canal, how important it is. Through this incident, we know the global supply chain is very, very vulnerable to disruptions. 
12% of global trade passes through this canal. That's, uh, someone did a study and they say it's 50 ships per day carrying 9 billion worth of goods, which comes up to about $400 million per hour. I don't even make $400 million per lifetime. <laughs> so that's a lot of money. Okay. The next thing about globalization is the flow of capital. This is something that a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, is not well covered, but I'm going to cover this because it's very important. It also ties in with other topics like the media. Let's get into this. The flow of capital throughout the world has become very, very uh, complex because you, know, you can transfer money to one country, then to another, then to another. So the banking system has formed this very complex, complex network in 2020, there was a, a series of leaked documents from the US which showed that major banks from the US and from Germany, like Deutsche Bank, they have been helping criminals launder money okay, from, you know, from uh, Dubai, from Latvia, from uh, Cayman Islands, Virgin Islands. It's just like a whole web of transaction, mon monetary transactions throughout the world. Now, this money is not clean. This is used by criminals uh, to fund their maybe uh, operations like, uh, uh, what do you call it, like uh, for drug lords to clean their money. Now, what is money laundering? Uh, for those of you who are not sure, money laundering is basically taking money that's obtained from criminal activities and then making it seem like it was obtained from legitimate businesses and sources. And after this report was released, it was uh, estimated that $2 trillion have, of transactions have been made uh, over the past decade or so to help criminals. And who's responsible for this? All the major banks. Okay? Uh, Deutsche Bank was responsible for about half of these transactions, Deutsche Bank in Germany. But of course, the criminals don't come from Germany itself. It came from like other parts of the world. Um, so I say this is related to the media because it was analyzed and it was uh, the op documents were obtained and published by BuzzFeed News. You might have heard of BuzzFeed News and the ICIJ, International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Uh, I have talked about ICIJ in my class. So this is another case of ICIJ. We talked about the Panama, Panama, paper, <laughs> sorry, Panama paper. We talked about the Paradise paper. Those two papers are also related to the ICIJ. So uh, just to sidetrack a little bit, the media has a very important role in exposing uh, the wrongdoings in the world, uh, sometimes even beyond the scope of governments to take on, because this is more international. It's not just like one government. This is like international crime we're talking about. Okay, and we have flow of information, which, okay, that's a bad thing of globalization. Obviously bad because it's dirty money. Then we have the good thing of globalization. We're talking about flow of information. That's the internet. What you're doing right now on YouTube, you're learning from different parts of the world. That is a benefit of globalization because the internet has enabled information to travel across countries. Now, before the arrival of uh, the internet, you probably had to wait for newspapers to arrive from elsewhere or you could only rely on news that you see on your TV. You can't access news from elsewhere. But right now with YouTube and all these platforms with the internet, you can access information, educational information from all over the world. If you know uh, the term, uh, if you know Khan Academy, Coursera, these are what we call MOOC, Massive Open Online Courses. MOOCs have kind of transformed education. Now you don't really have to go to school if you are from a, a poorer country. You don't have to go to, to university to get a degree. You can simply go on to Khan Academy, Coursera, get some credentials or certificates. There are a total of about 3,000 courses on um, on MOOCs and 19 online degrees. You can get your degrees from any part of the world and the cost that you have to pay is really low. So for those of you who are thinking of what to study in the future, you're not too sure, you don't want to pay that much money, this is actually an option. I'm not kidding. If, especially if you're going to IT, you can go on to uh, Coursera, Khan Academy to get yourself trained and that's all you need to work for major companies like Apple and Google. And the flow of information could be good, but with with so much free information out there, people also expect the non-free information to be free. Yeah. We're talking about movies, things that are copyrighted, you know, movies, um, educational uh, resources that you have to pay for. So let's just focus on films and uh, those, okay, like uh, the entertainment, uh, music, all these things. Uh, it has been found that the online piracy industry has caused the film industry 
about 30 to 70 billion dollars every year. On the internet, there's no respect for intellectual property rights. You can get, you can go to uh, websites like nights.tv, movies123. Okay, I don't want you to, st to start Googling this. I'm just giving you some examples. You can go there and watch movies for free. You can even watch like the latest blockbusters for free. That is actually putting a toll on the international, uh, sorry, on the film industry, especially from the US. Okay. So that's a summary about uh, MOOC, about uh, online piracy. Just give me a moment. Let me get a drink. All right. And then we are down to the next part of uh, globalization, MNCs, multinational corporations. Multinational corporations are such a foundation of our economy nowadays. In countries like Singapore, you know, many, many people work for MNCs. Uh, I'll give you some examples over here in Netherlands. MNCs make up about, uh, they, they contribute to about 20% of the employment in Netherlands. 20%, that's one fifth, that's a lot. And MNCs, are, MNCs, they create jobs, definitely, that's great. They also are responsible for direct investment, meaning they invest in like factories overseas or, or setting up of HQs or certain operations overseas. Uh, they are very important for transfer of skills and knowledge from typically richer developed nations to developing countries. So if you work for an MNC, you know, you can, you can kind of upgrade yourself very quickly because you have access to international uh, protocols and best practices. Now, MNCs also have some social contribu contribution. Uh, if we talk about the financial system, this kind of has to do with uh, the, the flow of money as well. We talk about financial system. The company Visa has been helping different countries to solve their financial is issues. What we're talking about uh, when we talk about financial issues like payment, sometimes is some people they have money but they can't make payment or they can't save their money because you know, they don't have a bank. In countries, especially in Africa, like Rwanda, uh, India, there are many people who don't have access to banks. So Visa is enabling that by giving them uh, mobile payment and Visa, sometimes even giving them uh, easy access to credit because without a bank or without a job, many of pe these people, they sometimes work in informal industry meaning they don't, they are not employed. They, they might be selling some fruits by the roadside, but they have an income, just that they can't get a loan from the bank because they can't prove their income. So uh, banks or these credit companies, they are offering them a way to get credit, to expand their business or to just help out in their daily lives. And in times of disaster, uh, companies like Visa also help with uh, emergency aid. If you have aid money coming from overseas, now it has to get to the people, but the people have, they have no access to cash, right? They could simply be given this card, like a visa card, and they can use that visa card to spend on, oh, okay, it's raining over here. Yeah, you can hear that thunder. You can spend on things uh, very easily. It's very important uh, in times of uh, disasters because when you are uh, displaced by a hurricane, it's very likely that you don't have your cash or passport or anything, proof of documents with you. You are just busy saving your lives. Now, without all that money, you have to rely on other sources of fund, and Visa facilitates that. And Visa is an MNC, as many of you would know. And multinational corporations also increasingly practice what we call corporate social responsibility, CSR. If you study globalization, if you study environment, I want you to pay attention to CSR. What is CSR? Is businesses doing not, um, not only what is good for their bank account, but also what is good for the planet, for the people. That's corporate social responsibility, doing the greater good. Starbucks is one of such companies that's trying to improve on their CSR. Uh, they have this scheme called the Fair Trade Coffee. When you pay Starbucks, okay, uh, traditionally, or let's say you pay a coffee chain some money to buy, a cof uh, to buy coffee, uh, much of the money is kept by Starbucks and maybe a very, very small percentage of that eventually goes to the farmer, the poor farmer who grows the coffee beans. And very often these farmers don't even get enough for growing the coffee beans because they are selling to a very large corporation which has huge negotiating power. They still want to sell to these huge corporations, uh, but the corporations have that power to, you know, to depress the prices of uh, coffee because after all, they're the biggest buyer of coffee beans. So Starbucks is engaged in what we call fair trade 
right? hopefully. I'm not too sure how much, how involved they are in fair trade, but apparently they only use ethically sourced coffee and they pay a fair price to the farmers. Right? They promise the consumers, whatever you pay me, I'll pay a larger proportion of that to the farmers and help them with uh, building the communities. Okay, multinational corporations, so that's a good thing about MNCs. So what about the bad thing of MNC? MNCs create a lot of environmental problems as well. Uh, they are huge, they can, uh, they have very robust business operations, but that also gives them the power to uh, shift their operations all over the world, especially to countries where the environmental standards are a bit more lax. Now let's consider this country, Indonesia. Indonesia has very lax environmental standards. They also don't really enforce the standards, right? So a lot of companies like H&M, Gap, Adidas, they purchase textile from companies that produce in Indonesia. In this river called the Chitarum River, uh, there are a lot of textile companies along that river and they dump a lot of pollutants, toxic pollutants into the river. And then they sell this cheap clothing to H&M and Gap. H&M and Gap will still buy from them because they're cheap. H&M and Gap, they are interested in only one thing, profit. So multinational corporations uh, actually contribute to health and environmental problems uh, in the area. Okay, what kind of health problems are you talking about? Uh, the, the river that I told you about, Chitarum River, people who live close to that river, the children, they have developed skin diseases, scabies, liver diseases. A lot of them were dying early. Some people were dying from cancer, but there's, there's, there's no study that shows that yet, but people were dying from many weird, weird diseases that they don't get uh, like the, in areas where they're not close to the river. Now, I made a video about fast fashion. Uh, if you are interested, I'm going to put a link below somewhere and you can go check it out, this uh, issue of MNCs causing environmental problems. Okay, And of course, MNCs are also responsible for health problems. Uh, I've also inserted a link somewhere at the back where MNCs are responsible for changing the diet in developing countries. What do I mean by that, changing the diet? Now, developing countries presumably had healthier diet in the past, meaning they didn't uh, suffer from things like obesity, diabetes. But now, because of all these MNCs like Nestle that enter these countries, they have um, kind of dominated the food market by selling processed food mainly. And people started changing their diet from more um, whole foods to processed food. As a result, many of these countries are suffering from an increased instance of obesity. Yeah, like I said, uh, I've uh, attached something at the back of the slide. You can go and have a look. I'll show you later. Okay, um, I'm going to take a short break um, over here. Uh, just a quick recap. We've talked about several things. Right? We've talked about trade blocks. We've talked about trade, trading meaning transfer of goods and services. We've talked about um, the, uh, what do you call that? Uh, my, oh, no, not migration. Okay, let me just go to that slide that I showed you earlier. Okay, flow of information, flow of capital. So we talked about one, two, three, four, five, five of these things. We haven't quite talked about migration yet. Um, so at this point, just ask yourself, do you have a piece of fact, just one piece of fact that you can use for each of these? Okay, if you have, good. So we're gonna move on to talk about migration. Da -da 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 -da. Oh no, not migration yet. I'm going to give you a case study. Last month, I believe, there was a, a piece of news that says the G7, the great seven countries, they came together to uh, create a law that says all the countries in the world have to abide by a minimum tax rate. So what happened? Basically, in some countries, uh, their strategy and economic development is just have very, very low corporate tax rate. If you're a company and you want to come, uh, it, it, I want to attract you, you're a big company, I want to attract you to come into my country to do business, I'm just going to tell you, hey, you know what? I will offer you the lowest tax rate for you to operate here. You just hire a couple of guys from my, from my country, you know, that's all I need. Or you just register your company over here, just pay me a little bit of money. So there are a few countries like that. Ireland, Ireland corporate tax rate is 12.5%. The EU corporate tax rate is 25%. We're talking about half. If you are a, con uh, a company, of course you want to do business in Ireland. Uh, and Luxembourg as well. Luxembourg corporate tax rate is disgusting, <laughs> let me tell you. The tax rate can go as low as 
below one percent, uh, if you have some special agreement with uh with the with the government itself. But Luxembourg is a very small country. It only has less than a million people living in there. Such a small country, but so many multinational corporations actually book their income in Luxembourg. What do I mean by that? Now you could be, let's say, you're Amazon. You do business in Europe. Now you've gained like billions of dollars uh, in Europe, but you're like, ah, but I don't want to pay like millions or a, even a billion dollar in tax, right? Why don't I take this profit and say, no, this profit was, yes, it was made in the UK, it was made in Germany, but let me book it in Luxembourg instead. No, I'm, I'm going to say I made this profit in Luxembourg. So that's exactly what Amazon did. Eventually, you know, during the pandemic, Amazon made a lot of money. Uh, most of you couldn't go out. You started shopping online a lot. And what did Amazon do? They booked their profit in Luxembourg and they paid zero dollar in taxes. Even though they made record profit, they paid zero dollars. And it's not the first time Amazon is paying zero dollar in taxes. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous, it's disgusting. Such a huge company, an MNC, uh, could do that. That is only made possible by this, uh, this international system of business. And uh, how does the global minimum uh, tax work? Now, these G7 countries, they say, okay, you're gonna have to, we're gonna have a minimum tax rate for all countries, it's gonna be 15% for all. You cannot go below 15%, right? Even though the EU minimum rate is like, I mean, average rate is about, what, 25%? They're saying, that, okay, let's set a minimum of 15%. You cannot go below that. That is to discourage uh, companies from going to what we call tax havens like Luxembourg, Ireland, and even to some extent, Singapore and Hong Kong. Okay, what are the impacts of this <coughs> mini global minimum tax? The tax havens are gonna suffer uh, because <laughs> some companies are gonna say, you know, screw this, I'm moving out of your country because now your taxes are high. And companies can no longer dodge their taxes. Companies have an obligation to, to pay a fair amount of taxes because they make this money from the people itself. They're supposed to pay taxes like everyone else, like the small uh, and medium enterprises or the individuals. They, they're supposed to pay almost proportionate amount of uh, taxes to the country for the common good because these taxes are then used for things like using the infrastructure there um, and, and so on. So if you're Amazon, you use the roads that are paid by the taxpayers, but you pay zero dollar, that's not very fair. And some political issues uh, that we're going to talk about is migration. Migration, very, very sensitive topic. Uh, increasingly, it has become a political topic. Now, if you live in Singapore, you know, uh, I'm sure maybe like a third or one quarter of your friends, they were not born in Singapore or their family members, okay, their, their parents were not born in Singapore. Uh, I believe it's the same in, uh, in a country like Mauritius. So migration has become such a commonplace thing around the world because people move around very freely. Uh, one of the reasons for increased migration is that we can start, we can still stay in touch with our family members right now through video call, to, through the internet. In the past, you, you couldn't really do that. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the, what do you call it, the barrier to migrating has become less nowadays. Okay, Japan is a country that has resisted migration for decades, maybe centuries. So it is a very homogenous society. You go to Japan, you don't see a lot of foreigners over there uh, unless they're tourists. But that is actually putting a strain on their economy because Japan has an aging population. They don't have enough people in the workforce to pay taxes. That's why the old people in Japan, they're having a good time. The young people, mm, not so much. They're really suffering. They're overworking. They're paying a lot in taxes, but they're not getting a lot from the government. So uh, the government knows this problem, so they're trying to change, slowly change the mindset of people and say, okay, why don't we start allowing migrants to come in? In 2019, they've decided to allow more migrants to come in. They're allowing 345,000 new low-skilled and high-skilled workers to migrate to Japan in the next five years. That's really not a lot, to be honest. I mean, Japan's population is like, what, like 100? million or something, I can't quite remember, but it's, it's, it's a huge country. This is just a very small number for Japan. But I believe that if they want to survive in the new world, if, if they want to cope with their aging population, it's inevitable that they have to bring in migrants. Okay, so yeah, good thing for you guys who want to migrate overseas, you can learn Japanese. I think yeah, yeah, you'll be in high demand in the next few years. Now migration is also important for the developing countries, the poorer nations, uh, it, 
directly benefits the economy. We look at countries like Nepal, which is next to India, Tajikistan, somewhere in Central Asia. Nepal and Tajikistan, poor countries, and most of the people actually work overseas. And then they send that money back home to Nepal and Tajikistan. Now, this money that is sent back home by migrants is uh, called remittances. Remittances make up one third of the country's GDP. Now, uh, for you guys, uh, my students, you know, you've gone through this before, so you gotta remember one third. Very, very easy number for you to remember when we talk about globalization. Hey, I think earlier we also mentioned about one third RCEP, one third of, um, of global GDP output. Anyway, that's migration. Uh, the good thing, uh, the bad thing about migration is a problem we call brain drain. So, you know, the brain going to another country, draining to a country. A brain drain is when you have educated people moving out of your country. People who have spent many years getting themselves educated in your country, they decided that, you know, I don't want to live in this country. I want to move out. I want to go to another country. And the African Union estimated that 70,000 skilled professionals leave Africa every year. Africa is a huge continent. I don't think 70,000 is a lot. Uh, but this, the fact that they are skilled professionals, actually, you know, it means a lot because in a country like Africa that requires development, they require skills more than anywhere else. Okay? They are the, this is the continent that really requires uh, skilled professionals so to stay in there, to contribute to the country, to bring in um, new products, new services, uh, new everything to help them develop. Yet, these people are leaving the country to other greener patches. Uh, let's look at Nigeria alone. Nigeria, huge country in Africa. They have about 72,000 doctors registered in Nigeria, but 9 in 10 doctors say they want to work outside Nigeria. Not necessarily outside Africa, but just outside Nigeria. So the Nigerian government has spent a lot of money training these doctors, and these people say, that, no, no, yeah, you train me, thanks, but I'm not going to work in Nigeria. I'm going to move overseas. That is a huge problem for the Nigerian economy. So brain drain, uh, big problem. Someone asked me, does uh, Singapore have a brain drain issue or a brain gain issue? Uh, brain gain is like quite the opposite. You receive talent instead. I would say Singapore has more of a brain, has experiences more brain gain than brain drain. Now, when we talk about brain drain, we're talking about people, uh, countries where the GDP per capita is quite low, like below average. Singapore doesn't really fall within that category. More uh, people want to come into Singapore than want to leave Singapore. All right, and um, it's 4.50 right now. Uh, let's talk about the political impacts of globalization. How is globalization perceived in other countries? How is it perceived? Uh, generally, most people like globalization if you are living in the developing part of the world because you know, your people are moving overseas. You don't get so, so many migrants coming in. Uh, in China, Xi Jinping says, so, uh, we need globalization because China wants to have that global dominance. It wants to overtake US as the leader in globalization. It's very clear because China, uh, a few years ago, uh, announced that they were, get, uh, they were gonna have the, the One Belt, One Road initiative or the Belt and Road initiative. If you don't know about the Belt and Road initiative yet, go and check it out. It's huge. It's gonna enable uh, increased global trade between Asia, Africa, Europe, Central Asia, this, this part of the world. Uh, India also um, prefers globalization. They say uh, nationalistic mindset is actually dangerous. It's even more dangerous than climate change and terrorism. Uh, the most enthusiasm for globalization comes from where? Like I mentioned, is in Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, these uh, countries in this region, they are really, really for globalization, trade, migration, everything. 70% of people in these countries are for globalization. And in Vietnam, 91% says globalization is great. Uh, I can imagine why, because a lot of Vietnamese, you know, they would like to migrate overseas as well. And there are people then in other countries, typically the more developed countries who are against globalization because they are at the other end of globalization. So globalization, it, it kind of levels the playing ground, right? If you're rich, you start to become a bit poorer. If you're poor, you start to become a bit richer. It starts to level the playing ground for everyone. 
Now, people in Europe are starting to say, no, we don't want globalization. We don't want immigrants coming in. And the, this sentiment is a result of the increased migration and trade from other countries. They see a lot of migrants coming in and they got um, th th this increased sense of uh, xenophobia. In these countries, in Germany, the EF AFD, which is a political party, and in France, uh, there's the National Front. National Front, uh, if, uh, National Front is chaired by Marine Le Pen. She's very famous for saying, you know, migrants should get out of France. Uh, we wanna, uh, we wanna stop globalization. We wanna impose trade tariffs. We wanna um, uh, ban religious symbols. We wanna uh, basically things that are just very, very uh, nationalistic. They want to protect their own French culture. Of course, she didn't win the election. Uh, another person won the election. Uh, but she's still pretty much, uh, this National Front and AFD, they're still pretty much getting a lot of popularity in recent years. Uh, US, if you remember, Donald Trump uh, is also anti-globalization. He started launching trade wars against China, started pulling out of like climate agreement. Basically, just just uh, it's like deglobalizing itself and that i believe is response of the increased migration that was happening in the past few decades it's just a response uh, which is understandable because a lot of americans are losing the jobs uh, to other countries when companies start moving the factories out of america to mexico to thailand this uh, people are starting to to be very angry with uh, these other countries and say you know we want to keep jobs within our country we don't want to trade with uh, with you guys okay um, oh, uh, okay, this is pretty similar to that. Uh, I would just like to point your attention to what happened. Increased trade in European countries, especially, especially Chinese imports, has led voters to shift to the right and to the far right. In 15 European nations in Western Europe, 15 is quite a lot, um, there's increased support for the far right parties, the nationalist parties. Okay. Okay, so we have covered so far flow of information, MNCs, trade blocks like EU, ASEAN, flow of capital. Remember, we talked about uh, the dirty money that was flowing through banks like Deutsche Bank, uh, migration, and trade. Okay, let me just pause for a minute and look at some of the questions you have. Yeah? Is secularism a sign of anti-globalization sentiments? No, religion and um, globalization doesn't quite uh, blend in together. Secularism, um, no, not so much, yeah, I don't believe so. In fact, you know, I think some countries are becoming less and less secular. Turkey, for example, secularism is really uh, depending on, dependent on the ruler and uh, uh, the, 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 the separation between church and state. Very little to do with migrants coming in. Um, if you talk about Turkey, for example, it used to be a very, very... Uh, religious country, and then it became very secular uh, during uh, I think Mustafa Kemal's time, and then now it became like very religious. Uh, in fact, I think one of the UNESCO heritage site, uh, I think it's Hagia Sophia, was gonna be turned from a museum into a mosque. They say no, it's no longer a museum. We're gonna turn it into a mosque. They're becoming more and more uh, towards less secular way of doing things. So there's nothing, nothing to do with globalization so far. Okay, uh, I see questions here. Hi KP, what's your opinion on the nation state ideology? Do you think it is outdated in today's globalized world? Oh, that is a whole question on its own. Uh, my opinion, nation state ideology, just, just to tell you what it is, uh, just saying that you know, we, should be, we should be a country, we should, you know, as a Singaporean, I swear my allegiance to Singapore, I wanna keep things as Singaporean as possible. I buy Singaporean products, um, you know, like migrants and everything, you know, I, I don't want them in. I want to keep Singapore as it is. Okay, that's more nation state ideology. Um, is it is <laughs> is it outdated? Yeah, of course. COVID is setting. COVID has um led to a very slight change in globalization. We are deglobalizing. We're doing less trade with each other, slightly less trade with each other. We're traveling less. We are migrating less to other countries. Yes, but. That is a very, just a very slight change, slight reversal. The overall trend is still, you know, you, you just cannot stop globalization. You can't stop migration. You can't stop, um, you, like no amount of politics can stop globalization. Even when China, uh, when US tried to stop trade with China, US was suffering. 
economically from the trade war. And eventually they realize the mistake and they say, ah, oh, okay, okay. Maybe we, we, we don't want to be too aggressive in, um, in our nationalistic sentiments. Okay. Uh, again, that's my opinion. No, uh, you might have different facts to support your view. Okay, uh, let me move on to other side of things, right? Hey, the last thing which I tend not to talk about is the social cultural impact of globalization. Now, this deals with like the intangible side of things, you know. Um, you have things like your feelings of national identity, um, your culture, how do you feel about culture. These things you can't quantify with money. It's more about you know, our feelings, our emotions. So let's look at this question here. To what extent is a homogeneous world culture desirable? Uh, for GP students, I typically advise against writing about culture, but sometimes it's inevitable that some of you will try and some of you will have to do if it's your AQ or you, you just have to write something about culture, then it becomes inevitable. But try not to write about culture because um, you may find it very difficult to explain it in the explanation. You have to have a certain kind of language to do uh, an essay on culture. You could do one paragraph on culture, but not much, so I typically don't recommend that. Uh, that depends on your language standard as well. So what about culture? Should we embrace a homogenous world? Homogenous, homo means one. Homogenous world is like a one culture world. So everywhere else in the world, you speak English, you eat McDonald's, you, you basically, you live like everyone else in the world. Um, now, first let me describe what culture is. Culture is what makes one group of people different from other groups of people. Now, we human beings, homo sapiens, we are 99% similar. But what makes us that 1% of difference between, say, a Singaporean and an American is the culture. Okay, of course, I mean, also like skin color and all that. Uh, but generally, it's the, it's the culture, like how we practice things, how we see things, our view, the food we eat, the music we listen to, and yada, yada. So a homogenous culture is like even wiping out that 1% of difference, everyone now becomes the same. Uh, is it desirable? I would say uh, homogeneity in culture is inevitable, but it takes a long time for it to realize. For a culture to die off, it takes generations, not years. We're talking about decades, maybe even centuries. The world was a lot more heterogeneous in the past, right? In China, people used to speak like thousands of languages. Now they mainly speak one language. So it's just inevitable. But uh, let's look at language, like since I've talked about language. Today, there are about 7,000 7, native languages spoken, but by the end of the century, oh sorry, by the middle of the century, 2050, uh, 2020, 30 years later, 90% of these languages are gonna become extinct. Why? Most of these languages are minority languages that no, like, like, no young people are speaking. They are mainly spoken by the older generation. The young people are just becoming more bilingual. They're speaking other languages. They are moving more towards dominant languages. So in Singapore, you see people giving up like dialects uh, or you know even their, their mother tongue moving towards English or to some extent Mandarin. And these minority languages will then slowly but surely die with the older generation. Uh, the extinction of languages is inevitable, uh, even though we might slow it down a little bit. Now, if you're asking me, oh, what, what about uh, <laughs> extinction of languages? Yeah? Uh, what are extinct languages? I can tell you some languages that are extinct. Latin, for example, is extinct. You don't speak Latin anymore. Um, Coptic language in Egypt kind of extinct is gone. You know, this is, is an old language. And in some ways, old English. Now we're speaking English, but our English, our version of English came from this other version that Shakespeare and you know, their, their predecessor spoke. Uh, they're gone. So languages do disappear from time to time. Okay, uh, cultural heritage. Hey, let me recall why I put this slide in. Uh -huh. uh, I put this slide in uh, for your reference. I want you to know how to describe culture in your explanation. This is not a content, I have nothing to share with you, but I have some, some words and phrases that you can look at. So you can pause in the video, you can pause over here and I'll try to try to register some of these words into you. If you want to describe culture, this is what you do. The intangible and tangible set of culture. This is just explaining what culture is. Okay, and cultural homogeneity is generally considered bad by most people because people want to retain their culture. Why? Okay, wait, this is the why. People want to retain their culture because we want to feel like we belong to something bigger than ourselves. Right, like I'm not just like a homo sapien, an individual with nothing. I am, 
you know, I, I belong to a country, I belong to a group of people, I belong to a clan, my surname means something, my family tree means something. So we want to feel like we belong to like a bigger part, like you, if you're a person from China, okay, you, you want to feel like you belong to this Chinese community, like this Chinese culture, you are very unlikely to give up uh, your Chinese heritage as a result, okay? Um, I think we human beings, naturally, we are social animals. We want to feel like we belong uh, at some point in our life. Even though you might be young, you don't feel that way yet. So, yeah, I want to be like someone else. Uh, but as you get older, your perspective might change. All right. Uh, the good thing about homogeneity is that we can have more standardization. Uh, the standardization is good in the context of, say, education. Now, if I go into... Uh, school, I, I would want everyone to be speaking the same language so it's easier for me to teach. If everyone's speaking a different language, their own dialects, then it, it makes it difficult for me as a teacher and for the government to control these people because everyone has their own clans that they, they, um, that they, they belong to and sometimes they fight against each other. So with a homogenous culture, people are more united. It's, uh, it, streams line, it streamlines the education system and the political system. So you don't have to please like 20 different factions in your country. You just got to please like one big uh, community. That is why, right, I tell you, uh, Singapore is pretty successful because Singapore believes in this homogenous uh, culture in some ways. Um, like dialect groups, you know, screw it. Your religious belief, your... Um, your uh, your language, your diet, whatever. You can keep it at home. You can practice it. You're free to do all of that. But you, you are a Singaporean. I don't care if you are a Chinese, Malay, or an Indian. You are a Singaporean. So everyone get along well. They don't fight against each other. And I've read that a country like Mauritius also has done it very well. Um, and, you know, in other nations, it's not so well um, well implemented. Uh, nations like Malaysia, it's very hard for Malaysia to get things done because the government constantly tries to pitch one race against another, one religion against another. So everything becomes very political, they can't get anything done. Uh, there were times that the Malaysian government wanted to change the medium of language from Malay to English. It was uns unsuccessful many times because they want to stick to like their, uh, want to stick to like a particular language. So at one point in time, uh, like I, I came from Malaysia, I, I grew up there. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, school was taught in different languages. Different languages. So there were people who learned math in, in Mandarin, there were people who learned math in Malay, and there were those who learned math in English and Tamil and yada yada. So it, it, it was quite weird. And a lot of different races, they couldn't quite communicate with each, with each other very effectively. I mean, they could get along well with some basic level of a shared language like Malay or English, but uh, generally they don't gel well together. So that makes it very difficult for the government to govern a very diverse group of people. Okay, uh, now the last thing about homogeneity is this idea of McDonaldization. If you take economics, you might have seen the word before. What is McDonaldization? Imagine everywhere you go, you see McDonald's, right? Now it is not uh, it's regardless of where you go, whether you're in Singapore, you're in Hong Kong, you're in China, you see McDonald's everywhere, okay? Uh, you uh, start to see like different countries doing businesses the same way. They start to have the same clothing brands. People start to dress the same way, eat the same thing and everything. McDonaldization is like standardization, but at a global scale. Yeah. Um, is it good or bad? That's up to you to decide uh, because, you know, if you travel to from one city to another, you feel like you're in the same city. You don't feel like, hey, you know, there's nothing different about this city. You know? From Singapore, I went to Taiwan. It's the same. They eat the same food over there. But uh, there, there are some changes nowadays. Yeah? Uh, we have these businesses adopting what we call globalization, which is a portmanteau. Globalization plus local. So it becomes like global, localization. These businesses are starting to adapt to the local cultures and say, you know, yeah, I'm McDonald's, yes, you eat burgers, but you know, well, what about, um, what about beef burger in Singapore, but mutton burger in India, pork burgers in Taiwan and Thailand, you know, they, just some, they, they alter uh, the, uh, the culture a little bit here and there to, ado to adapt to the local culture and customs. Yeah. Okay, and that is all for globalization. Just a quick recap, right? Oh, let me just go back. Yeah. Oh. So these six things we've talked about, 
And you see those, those six things, we, we've mentioned global trade. We talked about economic integration a little bit. MNCs, yeah, I talked a lot about M MNCs. Please study that. Uh, I have a strong feeling about MNCs you know, um, in, the, in the coming exams. Uh, flow of IT, uh, flow of uh, information, internet, uh, foreign aid. I think we covered this in class quite recently. Migration, uh, international cooperation. Uh, this is more for po politics. If you study politics and globalization, this is where they overlap. Yeah, uh, the social cultural side of things, uh, we just covered that. Health environment, I didn't quite cover that. I did talk about uh, the Chitarum River in Indonesia. That's about pollution and all that. So that has to do with that has something to do with globalization. And that is all. I hope all of you gain something from this. Let me see if I uh, miss out anything. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you like what you're seeing right now, please give me do me a a big favor. Help me click the subscribe button, help me smash the like button. Um, I mean, it, helps, it keeps me going. So I know that this crash courses uh, are helpful to at least some of you. Uh, and like I say, if you need more resources, just WhatsApp me uh, for the slides after the crash course. Just WhatsApp me. Oh yeah, how do you WhatsApp me? Da -da -da -da. Uh, where is that? Ah, there you go. Yeah, it's my number. Uh, if you don't follow us on Instagram, please go and follow us on, uh, on Instagram. I believe many, most of you here are from Instagram, but if you're not, go and check it out. There's a lot of uh, good information over there. Uh, Jovan helps manage the Instagram page. Uh, he does a very, very good job in making, um, making the information very relatable and very easy for you to digest. Uh, if you don't have Instagram, don't worry. Go on to our Telegram channel. And on the Telegram channel, you know, you can, you can just click on the links that we're, the things that we're sharing and, you know, just read these uh, articles that we're sharing. We share it on, um, like, quite a regular basis, almost daily. You'll see updates on news that's relevant to general paper. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, reading news is, is such a chore, right? Uh, you don't want to read news that's not relevant to GP if you want to focus on your studies, right? Just go onto our Telegram channel, okay? Uh, we have about 400 people over there. Uh, yeah, just go and sign up and read more. Okay, do you have any questions? Okay, I see some questions over here, Q&A. Uh, what's the difference between emigration and migration? A good question. Emigration, E, E, the E word means exit. Emigration is people leaving your country. Immigration means people coming in. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Type 99 already answered that for, for, for me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Type 99. Can we relate to Palestinian issues? Uh, Palestinian issue, very, very sensitive topic. Mm, I would avoid discussing that on such a public platform. But uh, globalization and, and Palestinian issue, the Israel issue, not so much. If you want to find out more about Israel-Palestinian issue, go and check out on foreign aid because Israel gets a lot of foreign aid from the U.S., foreign aid go check it out is bitcoin form part uh, yeah i don't know um part of globalization bitcoin yes yeah uh again i i couldn't cover everything but bitcoin is part of globalization yes okay uh i'm just gonna be around for a little bit uh, and that is the end of our crash causes. Uh, your, you might have further questions uh, for me, right? Uh, anyway, um, I will show you this. Uh, this is our Telegram channel. You can later on you can visit the the our YouTube again. You can find this QR code, scan it, then go to our YouTube our Telegram channel. Uh, further readings for you. One, two. How Brazil got hooked on junk food because of this big business, and you know, Luxembourg. How uh, is uh, helping companies avoid taxes? Mm -hmm. Oh, do, should globalization be welcome or feared today? Uh -huh. So you just talk about the good and the bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question should globalization be welcome? It's just about the good and the bad of globalization. Uh, so you want to look at the different domains of globalization. Uh, do not just, uh, whenever you see the word globalization in your uh, essay question. Do not do this, okay? Do not just think of globalization as like a concept. No, globalization is not a concept. You need to break it down. 
globalization is a combination of trade, is a combination of uh, uh, like a flow of capital, flow of information, uh, migrants, and so on and so forth. So you want to break down globalization into these different, different subtopics, then you address them. Do not address globalization as a vague concept and idea because you know, different people will have different uh, idea of what globalization is. And more dangerously, very dangerously, people think tourism is globalization. I had a student once write about globalization and, and she wrote about tourism. Oh my God. Okay. No, tourism is not globalization. Okay. Just focus on the six things I told you about. Okay. And I believe that is all. I will stick around for uh, two to three minutes uh, before I end this, but that is the end of this crash course. Uh, if you like it, again, uh, remember to share this with uh, your friends, your family, uh, and do remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.